Well, the title of the message this morning is Setting the Pace. And I feel like it was very interesting what Anna had to say and what Reba had to say about Rose and how it goes along a little bit with what I want to say this morning, what God wants to speak to us through his word. And we're going to be looking at some scriptures in First Thessalonians in just a moment, but before we go any further, let me say this. <clears throat> you know, whenever you're going to do something for the first time, it, it's great to have a, a pattern to go by. Uh, so you sort of know, you know, what to do or, or, or what to expect. You know, whether it's an instruction book for a project or a recipe for a main course or a dessert, uh, it, it's, it's good to have direction and guidance, and that makes a big difference. And it's, it's better even if you have someone to, to watch, a person who's, who's been there and done that and, and can provide an example for you. You know, that's, you know, YouTube, it's a great thing. You know, if you've never done anything for the first time and you need to know how to do it, just go to YouTube and you'll find whatever you need to do And from about 10 million different people, you know, that have done it before. But uh, it, it's good to have something to go by, somebody you can follow and perhaps copy, you know, what they're doing. And there's a term called setting the pace that we've heard before. And I looked up a sort of a definition of setting the pace, and it means to go at a speed that others try to equal, like in a race, or to do or be something for others to emulate or reproduce. But this deal about going at a speed that others try to equal, as in a race, The guy in front, he, he's setting the pace in whatever kind of race this is. And, and what Anna had to say and what Reba had to say reminds me that there's Rose, you know, out front setting the pace for those that, you know, follow her, follow after her. So I thought that was good what they had to say, you know, about Rose. But in the Christian life, also, well, Jesus, he's the ultimate pace setter. Jesus set the pace for everyone who will follow him. And, but he also had a plan to develop others to become pace setters, like Rose and Grady, uh, like the uh, disciples and the apostles in the book of Acts. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was, of course, the best known in the book of Acts and in the whole New Testament since he wrote, you know, over half of it. He, he was a pace setter. And Paul went to Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. And he was there for only three weeks. He preached on three Sabbaths before he had to leave because the non-believers, the non-believing Jews didn't like what he had to say. But uh, after his brief stay there at uh, the church in Thessalonica, and, and by the way, here's, here's sort of a map. Uh, there's Thessalonica, I circled it. And uh, this is on his second missionary journey. And after his uh, brief stay there in Thessalonica, and then when he had to leave and he finally made his way down to Corinth, which is way down here in the southern part of Greece, uh, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to check on the church, to see how they were doing, because he hadn't been there that long. He wanted to see how they were holding up, because, hey, they were going to be preaching and teaching the same things that Paul did, and they suffered affliction and persecution there at their church in Thessalonica. So he sent Timothy back to check on the welfare of the church, and uh, Timothy returned with a positive report. 
the Thessalonians, they were growing stronger. They were beginning to set the pace for others in the region where they lived. See, over there in Thessalonica, this is Greece today. Uh, Macedonia was sort of, I, I believe, in the northern part, and then uh, Achaia down there in the southern part. And uh, so anyway, having heard the good report, Paul responded by writing his first letter to the Thessalonians. And Paul writes, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7, he says, and you, you know, to the Thessalonians, he says, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Paul had preached there at the church in Thessalonica, like I said a while ago, for, for three Sabbaths, declaring that Jesus was the Messiah. And, and many of the Thessalonians, they were converted and they became devoted followers of Christ. So Paul had begun to set a pace for the Thessalonians and uh, for the, them to follow. And the Thessalonians, they began setting the pace for others where they were at in that region of the world where they lived and beyond as the scriptures tell us. Paul says, uh, again, in 1 Thessalonians, verses 8 and 9 that follow, it says, And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it. For they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. So Paul says here that the Thessalonians, they were being examples of faith to the people in their own backyard of, of northern Greece and, and beyond, you know, Macedonia. And their influence, it stretched all the way to the southern part of Greece. You know, Paul was in Corinth and he was... He was hearing there about the Thessalonians also. So this was where the Thessalonians were at. This is where they lived. This is where they were able to influence others. This is where people were talking about the faith of the Thessalonians. People were taking notice of the change in the lives of the Thessalonians and the message behind that change, behind that transformation in their lives. They, they were setting the pace for others to equal. And that's what can happen when God changes your life. You can be a pace setter once he changes your life. People notice the difference and you get the chance to tell them all about it and you set a pace for them to follow. And you know, it's time for the church to set the pace for the world that we live in right now. Yeah. So much is going on around us. And if we pay too much attention to it, it's going to set a pace for us. But we need to turn it around and the church needs to set the pace for the world, set the pace for our nation. So, as we read a moment ago, Paul wrote to the uh, Thessalonians. You have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. They had become pace setters, if you will. And I want to look at what Paul recognized in the Thessalonian church that made them pace setters. What the Thessalonians exhibited in their lives, what, 
what stood out to Paul as he prayed for them and, and what influenced other Christians in that region of the world at that time. And there's three things I want to look at this morning that caught Paul's attention as he prayed for the Thessalonian believers. And this caused him to recognize that they were examples or pace setters, if you will, to all of the other believers in that region. And again, as we become pace setters, and many of you already are pace setters, there are things that will be and are already being in many of you exhibited in your lives and that stand out to others and that are used to influence others in the part of the world where you live, on your street, in your town, in your county, in your state, in your nation. So, so I want to look at these three things that caught Paul's attention that we find in verses 2 and 3 of First Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul writes, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. These three things caught Paul's attention as he prayed for the Thessalonians. So let's look at the first thing that Paul remembered as he prayed for them. The work of faith. Work of faith. What is faith? Let's, let's just refresh, first of all, what faith is. Faith is the conviction of the truth of anything. It's the conviction that, that what we believe is true. Okay? That, that's sort of a simple, short definition of faith. But regarding our faith in Christ, uh, from the uh, Strong's uh, Dictionary, as regarding faith in Christ, faith is a strong conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. The faith of the Thessalonians was based on their conviction that Jesus was the Messiah through whom they would obtain eternal salvation. And that's what our faith as believers in Christ is based on. So we have a good idea of what faith is, but as we just read, it was the work of faith that Paul remembered as he prayed for the Thessalonians. The work of faith. So what is the work of faith? What is work of faith? Well, first of all, work is an action that you take. It's what you do. If you have a job, you know, Monday through Friday or, or however, every week, it's what you do. You, it's your work. It, it's what you go to do. It, work is an action that you take. It's what you do. It's what the Thessalonians did after coming to faith in Christ. First, going back to verse 8 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. For you, and this is in the New King James Version, for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. The Thessalonians' faith toward God. It was their conviction or belief that Jesus was the Messiah through whom they would obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God that caused them to take the action that they did, that caused them to do the work that they did. Your faith toward God has gone out, as it says here in verse 8. Your faith toward God has gone out. It was their faith that caused them to go out with the message of the gospel. 
It was the faith of the Thessalonians that produced the work that they did. Work for the Lord cannot begin without faith in him. So the work of faith. Faith produces the work that we do. The work of faith is what we do. And what did their work look like? What did the work of the Thessalonians look like? Just what did they do? Well, I believe that the work that they did was, was similar to the work that Paul did when he was with them for those just three weeks. Paul writes in verse 5 of that first chapter, he says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Paul's work of, of preaching the gospel to the Thessalonians looked like this. It was not in word only, but it was in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. You know, he assured them that what he preached was true. This is how Paul worked in spreading the gospel among the Thessalonians. Paul also wrote to the Romans, uh, explaining to them how he worked in the spread of the gospel. In Romans 15, 18, and 19, he says, Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked among them. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ. That's the kind of work that Paul did. That's the kind of work that the Thessalonians learned to do by following the pace setter, Paul working under the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of miraculous signs and wonders, the power of God's Spirit. In this way, Paul fully presented the good news of Christ. So again, I believe that the Thessalonians did the same thing because of their faith in the Lord. Their faith produced the work that they did. It was their faith that produced the work that they did. And it is our faith in Christ that will produce the work that we are to do. Our work of faith is what we do. Well, the second thing that stood out to Paul was labor of love in that uh, verses 2 and 3. Let's look at those one more time. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in your prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The labor of love. In that verse 3, <clears throat> we see two words. There's the word work where it says work of faith, which we've already talked about. But then there's also the word labor in the labor of love. And there's a difference between work and labor. There's two different Greek words used here in this verse for work and labor. First one is, is ergon. It's the Greek word for work. The other one is kopas, which is the Greek word for for labor. Ergon, the word used here in the work of faith, it has the meaning of that which one undertakes to do, which was what we were talking about a while ago, the work that we do. That's ergon. And that kind of work, it, it can be pleasant and stimulating. I hope that the job that you do during the week, the work that you do during the week is, is pleasant and stimulating. Uh, you know, you enjoy the accomplishment of, of uh, your work and, and what you accomplish each day. Uh, so that's what ergon is. That's what work is. But copus, the word used for labor in this verse, it's different from the word used for work. Copus means it's labor to the point of exhaustion. It implies 
toil that is strenuous and sweat producing. The labor of love that Paul is writing about in that verse, that was one of the things that he remembered about the Thessalonians was their labor of love. The labor of love is, is loving to the point of exhaustion. It's, it's love that is strenuous and, and sweat producing. It's, it's a love of blood and sweat and tears. It's a self-sacrificial love. This love, it's willing to toil and to pay a price. And this is how Jesus loved. This is how Jesus loved us. And just as our faith produces the work that we do, the kind of love that Jesus wants us to produce, this kind of love produces the labor it takes to love like Jesus did. His love for us was strenuous and sweat producing. He sweat drops of blood for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. He sacrificed his life on the cross because of the way he loved us. Jesus exhibited the labor of love and set the pace for those that followed him. He set the pace for Paul, all the apostles, all the disciples. Paul set the pace for the Thessalonians. But now Jesus he's, has set the pace for us too because we have the words right here in front of us, what we can do to follow him, to, to follow that pace that he set. Paul set the pace for the Thessalonians in how to love like Jesus did. And the Thessalonians exhibited the labor of love like Jesus did. And we have the capacity to love like Jesus did. So our work of faith is what we do. Our labor of love is how we love. Now, the third thing that we saw in the verse 3 that stood out to Paul as he prayed for the Thessalonians was patience of hope. Patience of hope. Again, in verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The idea of hope in the Bible is the idea of confidence, assurance, and certainty. Hope is the confident expectation that good is coming. See, we can still have hope in our nation because we have the confident expectation that good is going to come. It may take a while, but it is coming. A person of hope has confidence that God will keep all his promises despite every appearance to the contrary. That's true for us today. That's true. A person of hope has confidence that God will keep all his promises despite every appearance to the contrary. The hope of the Thessalonians included embracing the expectation of Christ's return. Going back to 1 Thessalonians in uh, verse 8 and continuing on in verse 10, it says... And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. Verse 10, and they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's son from heaven. Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. The Thessalonians, they look forward to the return of Christ. I mean, they were living like it was going to happen tomorrow. They had that hope. They had that confident expectation. Right. 
we can have that same confident expectation of Christ's return also. And it could be tomorrow. We don't know the seasons or the time. But the hope was the confident expectation of Christ's return. And verse 3 again tells us that their hope, he, he describes their hope as patience of hope, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. Not just hope, but patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. The word patience in verse 3 carries with it the idea of a steadfast waiting. The Thessalonians had patience of hope as they waited steadfastly with the confident expectation of Christ's return. And not only can we have this same patience of hope in, in steadfast waiting in Christ, for Christ's return, we can also exhibit patience of hope in overcoming the various challenges that we face in our everyday lives. I found this in the uh, Olive Tree Enhanced Strong's Dictionary. It says, patience in the New Testament is the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose by even the greatest trials and suffering. The Greek word for patience in uh, the Greek and in this verse is derived from the combination of two other Greek words. Hypo meaning under and the verb meneo meaning to abide or to remain or to continue. Hypo. Maneo. A person who has patience of hope is one who continues under pressure while waiting for the pressure to lift. Hope does not give up, but sometimes we have to be patient. Any of you that have had, you know, little children or, or grandchildren or, or whatever, it takes a lot of patience sometimes when they're growing up. Uh, it takes a lot of patience to uh, teach them, you know, how to do certain things as, as they go through life and as they, they grow up. Patience of hope. That's what the Thessalonians have. A person who has patience of hope is one who continues under pressure while waiting for the pressure to lift. I found this, illustrate this photo here of this, I don't know where this is, but uh, she had a lot of pressure. She was under a lot of pressure, but you can tell that she was being patient until she got to her destination to come out from under that load that she was carrying. This person does not give up no matter what may come his or her way. And it is the hope that we have in Christ that produces the patience we need to endure under the pressures we face. And we have the capacity to wait with the confident expectation that the hard times we encounter will soon pass. The Thessalonians had patience of hope as they waited for the return of Christ, as can we. But we can also have patience of hope as we wait with the confident expectation that the pressures of life that we sometimes face will lift off of us. Our patience of hope is where we wait for those things. So, just summarizing what we've talked about this morning regarding Paul recognizing in the Thessalonians 
that made them pace setters and what can also be exhibited in our own lives. The Thessalonians, they, they set the pace for us in that our work of faith is what we do. Our labor of love is how we love. And our patience of hope is where we wait. So that prayer that, that Paul prayed for the Thessalonians, it could be prayed for us also. Let's look at it one more time. Paul says, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. So this coming year, 2021, a month's already gone by. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, this coming year, we have the opportunity to be pace setters, to set the pace. Looking in our picture again. Maybe that was Grady in, in front, you know. He, he might have been a little faster than Rose, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> Grady and Rose, they were both pace setters. We have the opportunity to set the pace for others, as did the Thessalonians. That, uh, you know, so let us exhibit in our own lives that work of faith and, and the labor of love and, and patience of hope. And, you know, if we just set the pace for only one other person this year, one other person. Then the work of faith that we do and the labor of love that we perform and the patience of hope that is ours to use in setting the pace for that one person, that'll be worth it. That'll be worth it. So let's just close this morning and, and pray that uh, we can all become pace setters. Why don't we all stay in as we close this morning? God, we thank you for the example of the Thessalonians becoming pace setters in the part of the world that they lived in and how Paul uh, was their pace setter, the one who they followed, the one who they wanted to emulate, to copy. So God, we have it all in front of us, God, to, as to who we can emulate and who we can copy. We, we have Christ in our life, and, and he's our ultimate pace setter, Father. So just help us all this week, beginning this week, God, as many have already become pace setters in this room. God, help us to continue to set the pace, even if it's just for one other person. But God, show us how as part of the church in general, as part of the, the whole church in this country, how we can set the pace for our nation and not the other way around. God, we thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the, the Thessalonians again. Thank you for Paul. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ who loved us enough to die on the cross and give us uh, an example to follow as we love others like he loved us. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless y'all. Have a good week setting the pace. <laughs>